Olá, esta é a série Tecnologias e Qualidade de Áudio do FM ao Podcast, da trilha 7 Rádio, do 7 Experience Academy. O tema desse módulo é o uso de metadados para a melhoria da qualidade de streams de áudio e podcasts. E para apresentar esse tema, nós convidamos o engenheiro John King. Ele é consultor e um cientista da Kevin Merckx and Associates. Ele ganhou o prêmio Radio Engineering Achievement Award de 2017 da NAB. Ele foi o, o, que, o engenheiro que inventou o modelo de medição da cobertura de rádio digital e atualmente está trabalhando junto à AES para desenvolver um padrão neste sentido. Hi there. Um, it's a pleasure to talk with you all today. Um, and uh, I hope you find uh, the following information about audio specific metadata uh, useful. Uh, it's, uh, it's an honor to uh, speak to you through the, uh, the SET Academy. Uh, I had the uh, pleasure of visiting Brazil several years ago and meeting um, Marco and others there. And uh, Brazil is a wonderful country and I uh, look forward to uh, being back in the future. So the subject today is uh, something that we're doing as part of the Audio Engineering Society, uh, which has established a subcommittee uh, to update parameters which will apply to all online audio content. This is a technical document called TD-1004. You can get it on the internet. Uh, when we get to the um, uh, end of the document, you'll find a uh, a set of references. I won't show them here in the video, but uh, for those of you who uh, go to the uh, um, uh, uh, slide deck for this presentation, you'll find that last page with all of the references, including TD-1004. So the AES uh, uh, work applies to all audio streams, podcasts, and here in the U.S. podcasts have become a, a huge service, as well as on-demand file transfer, that is music on demand. The intention here is to apply um, new uh, standards which will offer higher audio quality and maybe prevent loudness wars. Uh, that's something that we have started to get see here in the United States, but uh, and I hope it hasn't quite gotten to Brazil yet, but we anticipate that that uh, tendency to increase loudness will uh, happen. So we're working on solutions to avoid that. Uh, we are using uh, International Telecommunications Union standards. Uh, I mentioned one here, BS 1770, which is used to measure the loudness of audio. This is not going to be done in one step. It's actually going to be done in two stages. The first step is to introduce an interim period for an intermediate loudness at negative 18 LUFS. Now that's a few dB lower than some of the current audio loudness, um, but it should be um, a minimal impact on services and very easy for all of us to implement. And that will last maybe two or three years until metadata, which is what we're talking about today, becomes available on uh, most consumer devices. Eventually, we intend to converge with the audio standards for video services at negative 24 LUFS. Now you can see that's a drop of 8 or 10 dB from where uh, some services are today. So that's the reason for this intermediate step. It'll depend, though, on having metadata on board the consumer playback devices, and that's why we're talking about that today. Uh, as you may know, online audio producers and distributors have long used techniques to compress and peak limit their audio, and that's, of course, to ensure that the audio is uh, loud enough to be heard in a variety of noise environments and also to protect against signal overload in the audio channel. However, uh, this compression benefits listeners in louder environments, but not all listeners, uh, because it reduces the audio dynamics, and that takes away from the sound fidelity. 
audio metadata, or what I just referred to here as metadata, can be added to any of these services, streams, podcasts, and files, uh, to identify parameters about that audio. The, in the playback, the audio decoders use this metadata to optimize system playout gain. Uh, metadata is unique in managing the audio playback dynamic range, as you'll see a little later in our presentation. Here's a little background on how metadata got started. In the late 2000s, uh, TV viewers, especially here in the U.S., um, really were uh, uh, fed up with uh, loud commercials and uneven loudness between uh, different program content. And a, uh, a law, a federal law, was actually passed to solve this. So the Advanced Television Systems Committee, which developed our DTV standard, and Dolby Laboratories developed a solution called uh, AC3 Dial Norm. Uh, that in video production uses the loudness measurement to a particular target level. It happens to be negative 24 LUFS, and it also adds metadata to provide additional parameters or information about the audio content. Uh, in the digital televisions during playback, that metadata is recovered and it can add other um, services to the audio, such as loudness management, such, uh, for example, for late night listening. Right at the bottom, you can see a little diagram where on the left, uh, the audio is uh, encoded for transmission and at that point, the audio stream has the metadata added. It's then transmitted through the channel, which could be over the air as digital television, or it could be through the internet. And then it arrives at a receiver or decoder box where the metadata is decoded and passed uh, on for loudness control. So those are the basic steps that really haven't changed in um, the past decade for all of these services. Earlier in this decade, in the early 2010, uh, video over internet, or what we here call over-the-top video, recognized a need for audio metadata as well as for uh, broadcast. And that was because viewers had to readjust their volume control when changing from one video stream to another. It also um, had a problem with the intelligibility of dialogue especially in some noisier listening environments. So some of the over-the-top distributors, that, uh, names that you would recognize, like Netflix and Amazon and Hulu, uh, uh, started adding meta audio metadata, and they uh, um, uh, embedded that into their uh, content. So why is loudness management important? Uh, well, uh, Online listeners, even more than video viewers, get their audio in a wide variety of uh, listening environments. As you can see in the little chart on the right, they could be um, uh, in vehicle, they could be um, uh, listening over a smart speaker or over a computer or over their smartphone and at various noise levels, as you see uh, on, the, on the range of uh, sound levels. That really puts a requirement on uh, audio playback to be listenable in noisier conditions. But on the other hand, as I mentioned, we don't want to sacrifice the dynamic range that was in the original content because under better listening conditions, such as in your home, that may be a quality to the sound that people would appreciate. Well, uh, in 2014, a part of the International Standards Organization uh, established a group called uh, MPEG, and they developed a standard, MPEG-D, which specified the parameters for audio metadata. And that's what we're using uh, in all of these systems today, those MPEG-D uh, procedures. Those describe the functionality for that encoding that I, and decoding that I showed earlier uh, and the transmission of the metadata. It also describes how this dynamic range control 
could be um, used. And some of the names that they gave were late night and noisy environment. So you can imagine that at, in late night conditions, if you didn't want to disturb your partner, you would want to reduce that loudness so that it didn't wake up your, your, your friend or, or, or partner. Uh, or if you were listening in a noisy environment, you were riding in a bus, you wanted to be sure to raise the quiet parts so they were audible. The um, challenge is that metadata requires frame accurate timing of the data. And uh, many of you are probably familiar with the so-called IDV3 metadata, which is uh, popular for artist and album information. Well, that's very popular, but it's really too slow to use for audio metadata. So now the MPEG-D dynamic range control and its metadata is built into the stream from encoding to decoding. And the uh, uh, familiar AAC codec family uses this metadata. It's already built in to, to the firmware and it com communicates directly between its encoder and its decoder. So minimal software is required in the players to support this. And it's already um, available and supported in operating systems such as uh, Android 9 and up and iOS 13 and up. So there are already a huge number of consumer devices that could take advantage of this MPEG-D dynamic range control. So we had a lot to cover here, so I'm going to end at this stage and uh, break for the uh, second part of our uh, discussion. Oh, All right, so should I just uh, carry on with, is that yeah. going okay? Uh, just uh, let me check with Silver. I have a fiber to home here and I connected to, uh, directed to, to, to the modem, but I have two, two freezing moments here with the internet. Uh, let me check with her if, if uh, it's okay. But here, here no, 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 Só deu uma, uma pequena frisadinha, mas o áudio dele continuou. E okay. como vocês estão em quadros menores, isso acaba nem, nem sendo sentido ou percebido muito, entendeu? Acho okay. que é tranquilo, eu, eu tinha visto, foram duas paradinhas, inclusive foi bem próximo a, esses, a esse slide. Fique tranquilo. Uh, tá bom. She said that it's okay. So, uh, uh, we can, good. We can uh, go ahead and we are back All with right. you. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. <laughs> All right, here we go. So in this second part of our discussion about audio metadata, we're going to actually um, describe it and demonstrate how it works, because I'm sure you're wondering, well, what is to me and uh, to my streaming audio service or to my podcasts? Well, I hope we can demonstrate that here. So the real benefit that we at the Audio Engineering Society um, believe is that this is a, a, an improvement in the experience for listeners. And that's because they can tailor the dynamic range of the audio as they wish. Uh, this will help preserve the uh, natural dynamics of the sound. That's that quality we're talking about and delivers that impact and, and excitement that uh, uh, we all like to hear in our, in our music or our dramatic presentations and so on. Uh, that also eliminates those side effects of excessive audio processing that are going on with some services right now. And we think really fatigued listeners. But it, it will still ensure that the playback level from one piece of content to the next is consistent. So people who switch their audio from one stream to another will hear the content at a matching level or matching loudness. Uh, they'll also hear the insertion of commercials, for example, at a level which matches the surrounding program audio. So the dynamic range control uh, is 
already being built into uh, the consumer players that are running uh, Android 9 and iOS 13 and, and higher. And with very little software, they can then manage the loudness range and ensure that all parts of the uh, musical or spoken performance are audible over noise. Or if they're in a quiet home environment, they can enjoy the full dynamic range. No próximo episódio, continuaremos com a segunda parte deste módulo da trilha 7 Rádio.